This is Think Big Show and I'm your host Mireille Sula. Today my guest has traveled from Paris. Her name is Isabel Azoulay. She is the CEO of Front Row Capital Family Office. Before I invite her to the studio, let's watch a video introduction about her. Today let me introduce you with Isabel Azoulay, the CEO at Front Row Capital and Family Office. Isabel's childhood was shaped by challenges and hardship that helped her develop a deep sense of resilience and determination. She grew up in a small town in Germany where her mother left her father for a much older man when she was only three, taking her two youngest daughters with her to France. This separation from her father left a lasting impression on Isabel, who had to learn to smile when saying goodbye to him so that he would remember her with a positive image. Isabel's mother and stepfather ran the family into a financial ruin, leaving her to experience existential anxiety and permanent fear of bills not paid. However, Isabel found her remedy in studying and excelling academically. She graduated top of her class with honors in bilingual German French program and received a national award in German. Isabel was admitted to Princeton University in the United States, which her family could not afford, but she made it happen with the help of her father. Isabel's determination and hard work continued as she put herself through years of intense, demanding program at one of New York's best investment banks. She made her own money, paid her own shared apartment in New York, and paid off her undergraduate degree. Isabel's impressive academic record earned her a place at Harvard Business School, which she paid for herself. After working for several years in alternative asset management, Isabel started her own firm, Front Row Investing in Emerging VC Funds. Her inspiring story is a testament of thinking big and working hard to reach your highest potential. As the CEO of Front Row Capital and Family Office, Isabel continues to apply these lessons and inspire others to achieve their own goals. Welcome, welcome back to London, Isabel. Thank you for having me. I know you travel a lot and it's not your first time to London, but it's first time here in our studio. It is, thank you. So um, um, what kind of memories brings you when you visit London? Oh, I had fabulous years in London working uh, in the early 2000s, a vibrant environment. I think a lot of energy here. People want to go places, whatever it is that they do. Uh, and I also love the fact that there is a, a sense of, of social life and energy that's regardless of age. If you go out, you find the 18-year-olds mixed with the 65, 70-year-olds and everything in between. And it's just a general level of energy that I love to dive back into when I come here. And how important is this energy in your work, for your vision, for what you do? What is energy for you? Oh, it's my main driver. I'm all about energy. I think. Energy is something that connects people or makes them not connect. Like for example, you and I. I didn't know you at all when you approached me to come join one of your events. And it's a vibe thing. It's an energy thing. You have a wonderful, super positive, very dynamic energy. Thank you. And I think we match it. <laughs> and I, I love... Um, I love surrounding myself with different types also because, you know, you feed off each other. You give, you take, and uh, so energy for me is my main driver, for sure, in all parts of my life. Yeah, and, and your life has been quite a journey. I mean, uh, yeah, it has been. watching uh, what you have been doing and what you have achieved so far, it's incredible. I would love to know a little bit more about your childhood and... Uh, yeah, uh, some memories from that period of your life. Uh, I do have nice memories, uh, but my childhood was definitely defined by hardship, family chaos, uh, financial problems, fighting parents. So, I mean, I'm sure they wouldn't be very happy if they heard that from me today, but it's just how it was. I'm the youngest of five, as you said earlier in the introduction. Uh, I was very close to my dad and my mom left and she left the five of us with my dad who was obviously in really bad shape which I then didn't experience as much as my older sisters because I was mm -hmm. three, four years old. Um, and when I turned seven my mother decided to take the two youngest ones with her so she pulled me out of my uh, countryside mm -hmm. life where we had a very kind of mellow living 
uh, to France. Uh, and I would say I'm grateful for that in a way because she opened so many doors for us by bringing us to a different country, learning a different language, putting us into an international school. Um, it did open the sky, the universe, the stars for me. But what I took from my dad, what I took with me from my dad is the steadiness, the feet on the ground, the you have to uh, be serious, you have to make your money, you spend what you have, you don't spend more, you, um, you're just, you have to think stability. My mm -hmm. mom is the cosmic opening uh, of, you know, the sparkle and the stars and reaching as far as you can and my father is the steady. Mm -hmm. So I got that from both of them and I'm grateful for both parts. Mm -hmm. um, I think what unfortunately, unfortunately shaped my childhood is this permanent existential fear because uh, my grandfather, after the war, managed to build a company, um, a typical Mittelstand in Germany, where not even having graduated from high school, he built a company uh, building wooden chairs mm -hmm. in a village in Germany. But he built a really nice life for his family, and his two daughters and their husbands managed to burn through all of that. So we went from doing okay to not having anything financially. And um, it put a lot of fear in me of, um, you know, missing the stability of not knowing the next day uh, what's gonna happen. So are we gonna lose the house? Are we gonna lose the car? Um, oh, we don't have electricity. Oh, we don't have phone. I, I grew up as a teenager with no phone at home. I mean, that was a time when everyone in the Western world had a fixed phone line. And we didn't because my mother couldn't afford it. And I had to tell stories like, well, our house is under construction and there's water in the walls and that's why we don't have phones. So um, the reason why I'm grateful for all of this is because I think I'm naturally driven, but that added on a turbo drive mm -hmm. to what I already had. And I definitely wanted to build independence. Um, independence, that's something my mother taught me, comes from knowledge. And what my father taught me, it's from making money. So combine the two, and I tried to be the best I could in school, to reach for the best schools in terms of universities and, and after that, and to go for jobs that combine passion and the ability to make money. Mm -hmm. So I'm lucky that my passion wasn't one that is very hard to earn money in. My passion was business and finance, so that's, that's a lucky one. But mm -hmm. I definitely combined uh, the, the purpose of providing for myself uh, with with the job I took. Wow. What I'm taking away from this uh, mini definition of your childhood, there are two concepts. One, um, I get to understand that um, you don't, s you never see yourself as a victim. You see half of the, of the glass full. You don't see it empty. And the number two, I would like to explore a little bit about the, the concept of fear. What is your definition? But uh, before we go there, so why do you think um, you, you, instead of seeing yourself as a victim, you just see something always as a lesson and turn everything around as an opportunity to raise above your circumstances? Where does this come from? Somebody else would completely uh, use it as an excuse, blaming, um, all kind of things that just to find a way to not take responsibility for uh, where we have arrived. So where do you think this drive comes from and where did you realize you have it? So to be perfectly honest, uh, I do have a share of blaming uh, to do. I definitely did it in my childhood and probably even today, uh, mostly my mother, really, um, whom I have to say, as I mentioned before, I am grateful for many things she taught me, but I do blame her for all the chaos in my childhood, for sure. That being said, I didn't have a choice or I felt like I had no choice. It's an instinct, it's a survival instinct. And maybe it comes from my genes, from my grandparents on both sides. They were all fighters uh, in one way or another. My, my father's parents were um, war refugees from Eastern Germany. Uh, and uh, my grandmother is one of those women that I will always eternally look up to with no means and no protection two small children in tow, she had to cross Germany twice because they were sent back home and then had to flee again um, in 
you know, terrible conditions, winter, mm -hmm. famine, and uh, I think maybe this is something that comes through in the genes. Mm -hmm. uh, same and when do you, when you think about your mother, do you sometimes feel sorry for her, or do you sometimes feel like she should have managed the situation better? The reason why I don't feel sorry for her is because she doesn't feel sorry for herself at all. She's mm -hmm. very happy with her life. And I have to say, now that she's older... Um, no, what I, mean, uh, what I mean sorry is like she had to overcome all these like uh, turbulences in her life and... Uh, to no, I don't yeah. feel sorry for her because she right. also had a choice. And she made those choices and she's mm -hmm. very happy with her choices. She has never mm -hmm. said, I regret doing any of this. That's very interesting because so. uh, your story reminds me my story. And um, my mother did more or less the same, even though she never shared with me the same as you're saying that um, she regrets for anything in life. I feel sorry for her. So um, very interesting. Mm. So, wh uh, so what do you feel about her then? Um, I admire her for certain parts of her personality because she's very strong and determined. Um, what I do feel sorry for is how egocentric she is because she doesn't even realize or doesn't want to realize the impact she's had on so many people by making her choices. Mm. And I've never heard her say, oh, you know, I made those choices. I was 35. It's something that was important to me then. And in hindsight, I realized what it has done to the family. She's never said anything like mm. that. She wouldn't question herself like this. Mm. So I admire her for her assurance. And if you'd confront her, would oh, she accept Oh, I have confronted it? her. Yeah. No, never. Any, she would never accept No, it. any of what I say would be, uh, she doesn't really fully know what mm. I'm talking about. <laughs> mm. no. Interesting. And um, so how this relationship has changed through the years? It's changed a lot. I, uh, I think uh, by the time I um, went to college, I ran out the door. I probably didn't even say bye. I feel so, sort of bad now because I was the youngest and uh, I just ran off to live my life and to build my stability. And then I had barely any contact with her for years because every time we saw each other, it would turn into a big fight from my side. Mm. Um, the moment it changed was when she met my husband. Mm. Um, and I swear this had nothing to do with my choice of husband, but if she had, could have drawn the husband for me, she would have chosen him, which is definitely not the reason why I did this. But <laughs> he knows how to handle her. He relaxes her. And so when she's relaxed, I can relax. And she's a fantastic grandmother. So mm -hmm. I think it uh, helped a lot when I had my children to see her act with the grandchildren as she didn't act with me. And for them, it's wonderful. So it made it easier for me. Uh, in the past few years. Yeah, that's powerful. Now let's talk a little bit about the fear that you mentioned earlier. So what was your biggest fear when you were younger? It's, it's hard to describe because I couldn't put a, a name on it until later on. It's a fear of everything disappearing, of uh, just the ground that goes away under your feet because the world you know, which is your nuclear family, breaks apart. Um, there's talk of uh, money loans not being repaid and uh, bar uh, I think they're called barristers in English? No, some lawyers who show up at your house to take whatever mm. is yours. Mm. Um, I think it was a fear of losing everything and no stability, the lack of mm. stability. I call it existential fear. Yeah. And do you think that was coming because of what you have to go th what you had to go through your childhood? Oh, 100%. Mm. And how do you think your childhood has shaped you? and has impacted the way you are today? It's impacted me 100% because uh, I do think I'm a fighter by nature, but this childhood put me in turbo mode. And um, what I <coughs> take away from it and what I love about it is that um, I have seen no barriers. Mm -hmm. I have had my eye on a ball and I went for it with the ups and downs and the losses and the wins and everything that's in between, it wasn't a smooth ride at all. And I also have suffered permanently from uh, imposter syndrome, very feminine syndrome. Yeah. Uh, I think at this point in my life, I've, I've come to understand that what I've done is, is pretty awesome. Uh, I have a hard time even saying it to you, although, you know, it's, what I've done is pretty awesome. Uh, and I'm, I'm starting to build on that feeling. So mm -hmm. that's why it's a great time for me to launch my own farm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, congratulations. It's, it's a great achievement. Absolutely. I agree. And um, as you share your story, it reminds me 
um, the story of many women that I have been interviewing in the past 10, 15 years. And you're right, many times women hesitate to uh, share their success, their achievements, their, uh, to celebrate uh, every little step that they, they go forward. So uh, how long did it take for you to build that confidence and be proud about yourself? I think that just happened recently, <laughs> so quite quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, despite the diplomas, the universities that are very well known, despite the firms I worked for that are all very famous firms, uh, somehow I think I, I have suffered from self-doubt by always mm -hmm. thinking I, I'm not as good as the others or I'm here by mistake or everyone else is smarter than me. Uh, but at this point I've come to realize, no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. I might not say or do the same thing as my neighbor, but I might do something differently very well. And I don't have to be like everyone else in the room. I have to do the best I can at what I bring to the table. And that's mm -hmm. fairly new. I would say mm -hmm. uh, talk this year. <laughs> and have you faced criticism on, in, on your journey to uh, learning and developing and growing to become the person you are today? I mean. Uh, we uh, all go yes. through lots of oh, criticism. Yeah, people yes. judging us or criticizing us. Yes, so in France uh, I went through the scientific uh, baccalaureate path. So I, I, I focused on math and physics. And the math teacher in 10th grade told me, um, you should just quit school and become a cashier in a supermarket. Wow. That's how dumb you are. Okay, so that's what did that, that mean for you? Oh, it, it crushed me. And mm -hmm. it's a very French way of trying to put you down mm -hmm. so that only the strongest people come back up. But that's not how it works for me. It just takes away from my potential. Mm -hmm. um, that was but one that stuck with me. But in fact, it didn't, because there are two options here. You can maybe take that internally and think, oh, that's so, so powerful and I can't handle it. And probably yeah, your self-esteem and your self-confidence will be completely shattered. But in fact, you didn't choose that. You chose the other way to become stronger. I've definitely been very good at getting up from the lowest lows. Um, but I think the path is not always necessary to suffer this much. So someone who puts you down like this, why is that necessary? But uh, yeah, it does make you stronger. That's true. So that was one. Um, then my first job in a one of New York's best investment banks uh, that shall not be named right here. Mm. Uh, my boss, he was 60 then when uh, I was hired and he was one of the top bankers in the bank. And uh, six months down the road, he told me, you know, when you walk down the hall, I thought, oh, another silly blonde walking into my office. Mm. She's going to be so dumb. That's never going to happen. She's never going to work here. And the problem is that I've had that kind of reaction even from team members at the time. Um, mm. I got reviews my first year that included comments like, if she could perfect her social life by 30% or her work by 30%, she would always work on her social life. I was an analyst in investment banking in New York City in the 90s. There was no social life. Mm. Um, gets too many phone calls from men. Uh, I'm working in a bank in the financial world where most phone calls come from men, but apparently for me that was a problem that who, who's counting? Who's even taking note of this? Uh, so yeah, those are the types of criticisms. And how do you deal with the criticism in not, general? Not well. I mean, with age, much better. But I think um, one of my strengths and weaknesses is that I t t take things very personally. And I had to learn over the years to make the difference with, between what serves me and what really harms me. Um, and criticism, I can take criticism when it's constructive. Actually, I, I, I welcome constructive criticism. It generally helps me. Mm. What I really dislike is just, um, you know, mean attitudes of negative something. And then instead of just brushing it off, I'll, unfortunately, especially if it's unfair, I've always had a very hard time dealing with that. I'm getting better. I'm and working on it. And how is uh, the relationship between you and you criticizing yourself? Because sometimes the biggest critic is the voice inside us. Yes. I how am, is that? I'm very hard on myself. I'm also getting better at that. Thanks to meditation, mm -hmm. because uh, during one of the meditation sessions I did, I was taught that you should be as kind and as much of a um, supporter for yourself as you would be for your best friends or your closest family members. Mm. And when I first heard that, I thought, 
Oh, wow, that's definitely not the case. Yeah. I can be loving and supportive with people I care for, but I have to learn how to do that with yeah. myself. Because if you don't love yourself, who else can love you more? Yeah. But I, I, you know, I understand as we go through all these challenges and we surround ourselves with people who all the time putting us down, telling us we're not good enough, we start believing that and we become that person that other people tell us we are. And it takes so much courage and it takes so much change and work to change uh, the internal voice uh, before we stand in our power and we start believing that, hold on, I'm not that person that other people told me I am. I am going to be the one that I always wanted to be. So how far have you come? Have you reached that, that big self, that higher self that you always wanted to see in the front of the mirror? I'm close to it. I, uh, as I said, it's really more recent that I've come to the uh, level of saying, what you've done is pretty awesome. Uh, and I think I would have told another person, woman, this years ago about the same profile, but I've come to that moment now. Um, I've come close. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. And, so uh, tell us that moment that you started realizing, because the very first step is realization. We all come into this world with some kind of gift, something that is special, is magic, and only, yeah, as know deep inside us, it should be somewhere. But some people never search for it. Some people never realize they have it. But there are some people like yourself that one day you think, ah, I'm going to do something. I'm going to claim it. When is that moment that you started claiming that I'm going to take control of my life. I'm going to take control of my thoughts. So w when, when did you realize that power inside you? Uh, in two steps. The first one was when I l left for college because uh, that's the moment when I said, okay, this is the beginning of my path of I'm in control. I can do jobs on the side because I'm old enough now and I can make money and I can use my brain and my energy to stabilize what was never stable around me. That was the first step. Mm. But the big step for me now came about six to eight months ago when it became clear that my two other partners uh, were not mm -hmm. willing to work together anymore. Uh, so we spun off our businesses. And the moment I decided I'm spinning off this business and I actually have a plan, I know exactly where I want to go. Of course, it was a thought process. It didn't come like mm -hmm. an aha, but this thought process of saying, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go this is how I'm going to do it, the clarity of that moment, that mm -hmm. was my, okay, yeah. that, uh, that's, I'm claiming it. That's like a wake-up call. And yeah. then, of course, it takes like a, a new, complete new journey. And yes. as I say, it's not such thing changing your life overnight, but there is one thing that you can change overnight, taking a decision, yep. taking a decision to change the direction. So you change the direction, you started your new venture. How big is that vision? It's big. Uh, I, I don't have a timeline of I want to do this until whatever. I am the type of person, I think I'll be working until I can't physically function anymore uh, because I love what I do. And I, I understand that there are jobs in this world where people are physically really not able to go beyond 60 something mm -hmm. and that there has to be a retirement age. But I'm fortunate enough to be in a type of job where that's not the case. and. I intend to never stop because I have so many interests and so many passions. Mm. So there's no end line to it. There is a beginning and um, I had the discussion earlier uh, with uh, Dar about how to start and starting humble and small and really knowing what you're doing, starting with the small tasks and doing them exceptionally well and then moving up from there. That's what I'm doing again now, even though it's my firm. I am doing everything the best I can at the smallest level uh, because I intend to excel and grow it to the stars. And do you think everything happens for a reason? As um, I try to visualize the whole journey that you, you took me now through uh, from your childhood to, to the college to working in New York and everything you have been experiencing. Uh, do you think all of that has been preparing you for a new big thing? One thousand percent, because I think all these steps made me into whom I am today. 
And 20 years ago, I don't think I would have had the idea, nor the desire, nor the knowledge, or the confidence to say, I'm starting my own firm. That, that would not have been in the cards at all. Mm. And it is today. And when you just said that, I, I suddenly had a vision back to when I was maybe four or five. My, fa my mother's father said to me, you're made for business. You're going to go into business. I didn't even know what it meant. Mm. But that stuck with me. And I feel like now is that moment, even though I've been in finance and business all these years, but I just connected that just now when we were talking. And interesting, you remember mm. that voice, yeah? Yeah, suddenly now. And if you were to talk with your younger self, four or five years old, what would you say to her? Don't change the thing. Keep fighting the way you did, uh, the way I did, or the way you're supposed to. Every step of the way leads you to where you want to be, and you're going to be happy in life because I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Is there any moment in this journey of your life that you felt like you have touched a deep, dark zone and it feels so impossible to get out there? Uh, many, 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 many mm -hmm. of these moments. Different ones, different reasons, different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, personally, family-wise, professionally, I've had them in every step of my life for sure. Um, and what is the hardest one? you? had to go through and it took long to get out of it? Mm. I think probably the moment when my mother took me away from my father because she, on top of it, she didn't tell us the truth. She said we were going for two months to France and I, I had a calendar and secretly I was crossing off every day that got me closer to going back. And a few days from the end date, I, w I saw it and I ran out of my room to my sister. I was like, oh, only three days and we're going back to dad. And my mom heard this and lost it, yelled at me, destroyed me for saying this. Now, in hindsight, I think she was hurt and insecure about her own child not wanting to be there. Um, but that shut me up for a mm. long time. And I just felt very stuck, lost, lonely, um, I think that was, uh, that was one of the deepest ones. Wow. Yeah. It's very interesting that we share more or less the same story. It reminds me of the <laughs> same age when I see myself in a van and traveling for maybe eight hours and I arrive in the middle of nowhere where my father is not anymore in the picture. How was your stepfather with you? Um, he was the same age as my grandfather, so um, he stepped away completely from the role of parenting. He had two sons of his own who were much older than even my oldest sister, because I'm 13 years apart from my eldest sister. He stepped away, my mother wouldn't even let him parent. So I can't say that he was unkind or mm. that he harmed us in any way at all, but he was there and my father wasn't. Mm. So, so your mother was very powerful? Very. Mm. She's a matriarch. Uh, she is a very determined, egocentric, uh, it's my way or the highway person. Mm. So somehow, uh, as you mentioned earlier, things have happened for a reason and everything has been falling into the right place. And um, do you think now, right now, you are where you want to be, in the right place, the right time, waiting for the right things to happen? I am exactly where I need to be right now. So. That doesn't limit the possibilities going forward. But I'm exactly where I need to be right now, and it's a great feeling. And what do you do to keep this momentum up and to keep your thoughts clear and to keep clarity for your vision? Uh, do you have some thing that you would share with us? You mentioned you do meditation. What else you do to keep your self-development into the best um, standard? I have a routine. Um, I have three children, a puppy dog, uh, the husband, my own life, the friends, uh, work. So days fly by and evenings are never free. There's never a moment when I can calmly um, spend time for myself. So I do it really early in the morning and I don't love to get up early, but once I'm up, I love it because it's quiet, often dark out. It's my moment for me. And I started with herbal tea, meditation, um, Pilates and yoga for about an hour and that's what gives me a lot of strength like inner and outer strength mm -hmm. um, and then I follow up with my other passion coffee 
<laughs> <laughs> and you have three children. Yes. A happy marriage. Yes. A husband that supports you. Yes. Uh, you do more or less the same thing, but in a different way. Yes. Tell us how does it work and how fulfilled are you now being a woman uh, in fulfilled in her career, a mother of three, having a, a great family, traveling the world, uh, serving other people. Uh, how would you define this uh, now, the power of now? Uh, the power of now for me is I've, I'm hitting my stride. Um, my husband and I have been together for 21, 22 years. Uh, and married for 15 or 16, but we're not counting. That's the funny part. When people ask us, like, how long has it been? We have to think, like, when was Yesterday. It <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what's great is that we're evolving together, um, s at least so far. I hope it's going to continue for the rest of our lives like this. Um, we're not growing apart. We're growing together, which mm -hmm. is really nice. I'm very curious to know, how did you meet each other? Uh, it's, it's not that... Uh, uh, original in business school. <laughs> okay, so you're we, studying in the same school, we yeah? We studied in business school together. And was love first sight? No, I was actually engaged at the time. Oh, were you engaged with somebody else? Yes. That's interesting. I now you're engaged. opening a complete new chapter. I completely <laughs> forgot to tell you about <laughs> this, new, this other right. chapter. I was engaged so you, to a, a mm -hmm. wonderful man, American. Mm -hmm. um, I was with him for four years and I was not ready to get married at all. Uh, but I was very much in love with him, and he was a great guy, and somehow it just happened in a bar that he asked me to marry him, and I don't know, it just happened. Um, for various reasons, I felt it wasn't right. Not be, I mean, great guy, smart, kind, but it was just not right for me. And um, Alex, my husband, had a girlfriend at the time, but he was ready to separate from her, and uh, uh, in my case, I left my fiance and suffered through a year and a half of self-blame. I mm. thought, I'm no better than my mother. Mm. I gave my word to an honest man. I told him I'm going to spend the rest of my life with him. I made him believe all of this, and now I'm changing my mind. I'm no better than her. Mm. So it took me probably a year and a half to forgive myself. And I forgave myself in the mountains of Peru, by the way, at Machu Picchu, for whatever reason, I had an epiphany up there that I can forgive myself. And during this period of a year and a half, we were a group of friends, and Alex was one of my good friends. But somehow over six months, the feelings changed, and he wasn't with his girlfriend anymore, I was not with my fiance, and then suddenly I thought, okay, this is the man of my childhood dreams. I had, an, I had a vision of my future husband when I was little. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why I had that vision, but he was that vision. And I thought, oh my God, I'm not ready for this. I have to first forgive myself. <laughs> wow. But he didn't give me time to wait. And he was very patient with this whole like, trying to forgive myself period. So Wow, that's powerful. It, it sounds like um, deep inside you, there is something that you trust a lot. There is that intuition that is a guide for you? Has that been guiding you for uh, challenging moments or yeah. doubting situations? Absolutely. Inner voice. Listen to your gut. Listen to your inner voice. That's uh, something that the sisters, my sisters and I, have always told each other in moments of hardship. Mm. So, yeah. And how is your relationship with your sisters now? Oh, completely dysfunctional. <laughs> right. Is this uh, a kind of typical you know, model of dysfunctional families? I think or so. did you try to change, let's say, the model or to change the paradigm? I or did. Or just you accepted it as No, it is? I did all my childhood and most part of my adult years. I tried to keep everyone together and get along with all of them. But I think each of us has a different story because of a different age when mm. all of this happened with my parents and different impacts on them. Mm. And they have different memories from me and uh, they hold grudges that I don't understand and I am hurt by things they don't understand. So mm. um, the sister I moved to France with, we're three years apart, we're like twins in a way and we have similar lives and we're super close. And with the others, it's, it's roller coasters, uh, different roller coasters. Uh, and f I just lost my father in January, and that's mm. when the whole dysfunctional side came out really, really strongly, yeah. how different we, differently we view things, feel things. But we managed to yeah. come together. Yeah, so. I remember you, you told me about your father, and you felt really bad about it. You're grieving. How yeah. is it? 
How is that grief feeling now? I, I feel like I haven't gotten the chance to properly mourn. Um, in the beginning, like the few, maybe one or two weeks after his passing, that was all consuming. But then I had a really bad accident uh, in the mountains and mm. that took all of my attention mm. to getting physically well and being there for myself and for the family. And then the kids and work and whatever else happens. And I, I realized recently that I have not taken the proper time that I should because mm. I miss him terribly. Is there anything that you would like to tell your dad that probably you didn't have the chance to tell him when he was alive? I'm lucky to say that I told him I love him a million times. Mm -hmm. um, I did write him a letter and I said everything in that letter. Um, I wrote him a letter just as he passed and I, I read it at his funeral and I put it in his grave and it's a long letter. Um, so, and on top of it, if I start getting into those topics, you're going to see me crying here. So I'm lucky to have shared with my dad a really strong relationship, a lot of sharing of personal emotions, mm -hmm. the good, the bad. Um, and I keep connect, I'm trying to keep connected with him mm -hmm. now. So that's have you ever thing. thought how your life would be if you'd have been living with him instead of going to France? Um, yes, I ha I've asked myself that question. I think part of it different because what I got from my mom is reaching for the stars. My father is a wonderful father and, and, and person, um, but I don't think he would have pushed me as far as I've mm -hmm. gone, which my mother gave me as a, as a guiding force. So maybe a more stable life, but maybe, maybe I would have taken longer to get to where I am right now. Mm -hmm. But then again, you know, the concept of sliding doors, what happens if I don't yeah. take that exit now? And I do yeah. think that you end up more or less where you're supposed to be at some point yeah. in your life. So, Is there anything you regret in life so far from your past? Uh, no. No, because it's just whatever has happened is, uh, is who I am. And uh, if there were things I needed to apologize for, I have. And um, things I did wrong, have also shaped me into who I am today. So, no. And has this, um, the, the whole, you know, Holocaust that you had to experience as a child and uh, taking responsibility and control for your life, how this is now uh, influencing the relationship between you and your children? Are you that mama that you want to do everything for them, everything that you miss in your childhood, you want to make sure that they have it? or you have learned how to uh, build that, um, you know, boundaries as well, but... No, I'm not good at the boundaries. I'm a <laughs> super involved mother. I'm, you know, my eldest is 15. It's, he's a boy, so he wants his distance, um, which is good because that way I have to take the distance, but I'm a very involved mother. Um, I do try to be the reliable person that I was lacking, mm -hmm. that I try to I try, I'm, I'm pretty sure I made this, that they know when I speak and I say something, I mean it and I stick to my word and it's not a white lie for whatever reason. So that part I'm definitely doing with my kids. Um, being very involved and present, I think it's uh, for me that I'm doing this and it's too much at times and uh, I think they don't know the boundaries because I never set them mm -hmm. and that's, I'm learning that now as well. Mm -hmm you know, fencing myself off a little bit because I, I've, I've always been super extra available. Yeah, you know? that's amazing. And uh, Isabel, do you think you're living your purpose? Yes. So I you have found it? Yes. Um, I, my, my gut feeling is really that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And what's great is that I'm so not done. This is just the beginning of lots more to come. And I have mm -hmm. lots of interests that I can still pursue and uh, yeah. So, so what is your biggest vision? What is the biggest picture that you can visualize yourself, let's say, in the next 10 years, 20 years? That I build my firm into um, a structure that would allow me to sustain the entire family on my own, um, which is not necessary, but I want to be able to do that. And mm -hmm. I'm just starting out, so that's not the case right now. Um, I want to teach in university again. I did for a semester and it's one of my best experiences. Mm -hmm. My father was a teacher, so I'm the only one of the five who's um, 
interested in or passionate about teaching. And that experience in university was mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. um, so I do want to go back into university teaching. Um, those are the two visions right now, more to come. And if you have uh, young people listening to this right now, to your message, what would be three tips that you'd share with them? What do you mean young? We're young. <laughs> the young, you mentioned that I you know, teach know, at the university, yeah, and yeah. They, they don't know what to, where to start, what to do. They want to start their life. And um, I'm talking about young people at university. I think it's not, it's not we're young, yes, yeah, absolutely. Young. <laughs> I am, uh, it's not given to everyone to, ha to know their passion, and I'm fortunate enough to know it and to have known it. Um, I would say if you don't know what, what your passion is, give yourself the means to build it. You have to listen to yourself. Again, this inner voice, this gut feeling. What am I good at? What do I want to develop more? How do I see myself? Do I see myself uh, behind a camera? Do I see myself in a conference room leading a meeting? How, how do I visualize myself and how do I get there? So if you don't know it off the get-go, give yourself the, the means of mentors, people around mm -hmm. you who, who can guide you, and also the financial means. So make sure that you work, that you can make money to give yourself the environment that mm -hmm. you want to be in to find that passion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. It has been a, a great pleasure, a great honor to have you in the studio. And thank you for being so open and courageous to share <laughs> from the things that you haven't shared before. True. I really appreciate your trust. And it has been very powerful. And um, I can't wait to see the next 10, 20, 30 years of your journey, which is going to be big, because you think big and you have earned to be a successful woman as you are today. Thank you. Thank you, Morella. Thanks for having me.